Excellent. So we're there in Daniel 12. If you'll turn your Bibles over to Daniel 12. And uh, we're there in verse, we'll read verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to be in verse 10 for the uh, title of the message. And the title of the message is basically just soul winning. And, you know, uh, there's two reasons why uh, I'm preaching a message like this today. Number one, we got our soul winning mega marathon coming up in, on April 20th. But, I mean, if this is going to be a thing that we're going to do every year, I mean, we should always preach about soul winning, but I don't know that I necessarily would preach a message, the same message every year on soul winning as we lead up to it. But the, there's two things that stand out. Is Number one, we're getting ready for that, and I think it's appropriate since it's something that we've ramped up and we're doing consistently. But number two is that, you know, this is just another one in the series of five sermons about, you know, just the foundations of the faith. So we went over just the eternal security. You know, once you're saved, you're always saved. You know, we've talked about baptism. We've also talked about, you know, the uh, incorruptible Word of God and just how you need God's Word, perfect Word, to give the Gospel. And I actually planned to talk about so many before that, but I thought you have to do things decently and in order, and God's Word is necessary. God's true Word is necessary in order to give the proper Gospel. And then just what is soul winning? You know, a lot of people throw that term around and talk about it, and uh, you, you realize there's a lot of misinformation and misconceptions. So I just wanted to give a biblical stand on what I've experienced with soul winning and what soul winning really is based on the Bible. First of all, it's something that you do find in the Bible. We're going to see that here. But uh, right there in Daniel 12, you know, Pastor Cobb, a couple of months ago, we were meeting and he uh, brought this up and showed it to me. And it just was uh, really eye opening that we see this even in the end times. And so there, there in Daniel 12, verse 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written, the book, uh, written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And let's just go down to verse 10 of Daniel 12. It says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So there's something to be said. There's a couple of things that stand out here. I mean, I'm, we could preach on Daniel 12 just on its whole pro prophetic message and, you know, speaking of the resurrection and the return of Christ. But here we see a couple of things that stand out for the soul winner. First of all, it says that uh, in verse 2, And that at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So there's no discrimination. Everybody that's found in the book shall be delivered. And it's speaking of the book of life. And that's really what we're working for when we're leading others to Christ. Because we're speaking of soul winning. You know, we've... Given, we've been given the gospel. Somebody led us to Christ. Somebody took time out of their lives and thought it was more important to spend a couple of minutes with me or with anybody else who's been saved and teach them what it is to be saved. And the way that we can return that favor is by going out and soul winning. Now, is it necessary to soul win to be saved? No, but it is a, it is a good thing, the Bible says. And then right there in verse 12, it says, And many that sleep in the dust and the earth shall wake some to everlasting life, so, and this is an Old Testament uh, uh, verse, and I, and I make that reference because a lot of people like to argue the validity of the old versus the new. We see salvation there in verse uh, 2 of Daniel 12, 2 in the Old Testament. It says, some to everlasting life and some, uh, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So we see the message is the same. Some will be with Christ forever. And obviously, this is talking about the, the body reuniting with the soul. The Bible, you know, we're not going to go into that, but the Bible speaks of, you know, when we die, it, you know, to be absent in the body is to be present in the spirit if we're saved, right? But there it says, and shame, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then when, the other thing we're going to notice is that some people are going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is a serious thing. And they that be wise shall, be, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and wisdom is attributed to soul winning. If you want to gain more wisdom, you know, the beginning of 
The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, is the beginning of knowledge. But also, there's other things that add to your wisdom. And one of the things that adds to your wisdom is going out there and sowing. Because that second part of that verse says, And they that turn many to righteousness. Well, the only righteousness that we can turn them to is Christ. He is our righteousness. As the stars forever and ever. And then we see again in verse 10, just to close this part out, it says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly. See, the wicked are going to do what they do, the Bible says. So we need to do what we need to do. And not, not, uh, not let uh, the affairs of the world draw us into those things. It says, and none of the wicked shall understand. See, when we go out soul winning, that's why not everybody that, that we talk to gets saved. We, we need to not uh, be concerned about that, but we need to be concerned about the gospel message. Some will say yes. As a matter of fact, today, you know, it, as I, I mean... I wrote this, and I was going to preach it regardless of the results, but God bless that we had seven people, uh, uh, seven, six young children and one adult saved today when we were out soul winning. But we, you know what we also had? We also had a child who after I, you know, compelled him and after I exhorted him and after I supplicated with him three times, he said he wasn't interested in the gospel message. It says, you know, but the wicked shall do wickedly. I'm not saying this kid was wicked, but what I'm saying is sometimes they're just not interested. It says... And none of the wicked shall understand. I don't know if he just doesn't understand because, you know, it's not his time. Or maybe he's, he's, he has other things in mind. It says, but the wise shall understand. You know, those that accept Jesus Christ, those that believe on the Lord, the gospel message from the Bible, they're wise, the Bible says. And then if we just go to Proverbs 11, verse 30, we're just going to back that up. And it says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So see, we see that this, this, uh, the message is consistent. You know, you let the Bible define the Bible. You use the Bible to define other verses in the Bible. You don't go outside of man's, I mean, outside of the Bible and, and seek man's wisdom because man's wisdom is inerrant. No matter how much someone studies, no, how much, no matter how much they know, they're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. But the Bible is true and through all the way. You know, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing inerrant. There's nothing infallible about God's word. And right there we see that it says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. So if you want wisdom today, you know, go out and win some souls. So that's what soul winning is in a, in a nutshell is number one is that it gives you wisdom and it's turning those to righteousness, turning many to righteousness. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of like what my soul winning experience has been over the years since I got saved and why I'm so adamant about the way that I so win now. You know, I, I didn't get here overnight. You know, I've been saved for almost 15 years, and it, this wasn't, it, and this is not the way that I went so winning 15 years ago when I first got saved. When I first got saved, you know, somebody just told me that I needed to learn the Romans road, and they gave me some web reference and showed me like Romans 3.10, 3.23, and I remember I, it was so sporadic the opportunities I got to give somebody the gospel one-on-one, -on -one that I always had to have it on my phone or in a piece of paper because I just hadn't memorized the gospel message, you know, the, the Romans Road, because it's not something that you do regularly. You know, it wasn't, so it's not that I wasn't willing, it's just that nobody had taken time to show me in the Bible what the gospel message is. And I think the challenge because of that is, because what is soul winning is not, is it, it's not what the world tells you should be. And the reason I say that is because I just looked up, I made two Google searches. Number one was, soul winning churches in Houston and I could maybe find a handful of churches. I'm talking like two or three. I know we know there's a church down the road, Pure Words Baptist Church, that goes soul winning. I know we go soul winning. We're updating our website so it didn't even pop up. And there's another church uh, down over here in Katy called West Side Baptist Church, I think. And they have a soul winning time. Other than that, of all the thousands, it's probably in the thousands of churches in Houston they, they don't have a soul winning program. There was one church that popped up that popped up through the search. I don't know if they just had on their website somewhere soul winning, but I couldn't find it on their website. Plus, they had a, a pastor male and a supposed pastor female. So we know that they're not even giving the gospel message correctly. You know, I mean, there's, there's other things that, that, that I'm not going to get on that uh, soapbox, but if you know, if you've been coming to church for a while, if you're reading your King James, you know what I'm referencing. But look, I mean, I looked up, so then I looked up Soul winning, what is soul winning? I just did a real simple search for soul winning, and there was maybe two or three references right at the very bottom that had it right. You know, that they, they were referencing some uh, soul winning reference to the Bible, but most of them were just like what 
what people thought. And there's the one that, the, that stood out to me was this one by Lifeway Resources. I didn't know, you know, I don't keep up much with uh, all the, the publishers and stuff, but there's a company called Lifeway Resources, and they print, I guess, biblical material and all kinds of stuff. But in there, they're not printing just, not everything they print is biblical. Some of it's just what they think, but they also write articles. I didn't realize this. And they have one that says, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Soul Winners. Now, if you know where, where they're getting the seven habits from, uh, you know, a couple years back, this is when I first started in business about 20 years ago, there was a real popular book called Seven Habits of Highly uh, Effective People. The challenge with that book, and the only, it's funny, even before I got saved, I, I didn't want to read it because the only challenge with that book is it was written by a Mormon who's a staunch Mormon telling you how to run a successful business. If you know anything about Mormons, they're all about money for filthy lucre's sake. I mean, it's all about money. If you, if you ever studied or you paid attention to Mitt Romney, when he ran for presidential, one of the biggest things that they had against him was that he's a big capitalist. I mean, I'm just giving you the points. So anyways, I never read the book, but that caught wind. And in many uh, circles of life or in many aspects of life, people have written different books with a similar title, like Seven Habits of you know, Highly Effective Chefs or Seven ha Habits of Highly Effective you know, Exercising. And th that's what these guys are taking this from. But what really stood out to me here is just, it says, I interviewed... Now, the author doesn't even give him his name here. And it says, I interviewed eight Christians that are considered by their church, pastor, or Christian friends to be soul winners. And I have attempted to discover some of the habits. So the challenge is, I was looking for Bible references, just like the things that, that would lead me to what, what is a proper soul winning. And this is why our world is where it is. This is a big program. I didn't realize that, that, that people read this and implement it in their churches. And they sell programs in here through Lifeway Resources to supposedly improve your soul winning. And then right here, I'm not gonna read it all, but habit number one, soul winners are prepared. So, you know, I mean, that sounds good. I mean, we should be prepared. We should know the soul winning, I mean, the, the gospel message. But then they go and they're like, it's someone who walks closely with Christ and maintains a consistent devotional life. They're active in their ch churches and are members in good standing. They attend worship in Sunday school and study their Bibles regularly. They're trained. That's okay. But then it says, soul winners have been trained in one or more gospel presentation strategies. Look, there's only one gospel presentation strategy. It's the one found in the Bible. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Bible says that you have to believe on the Word. You have to believe in Jesus to get saved. There's no other way to get saved if you don't have the Bible with you. As a matter of fact, there's nothing more powerful than God's Word. You know, the last person we led to the Lord today, I showed her in Spanish some key verses about believing and how about you don't need to be a good person and you don't need to go to church. And all of a sudden their eyes got open to the gospel because God's word has power, right? Here they give you a couple of things. They say, so winners have been trained in one or more gospel presentations such as faith. And they have it capitalized so that I know what they're referring to. It's an acronym of some sort, some program they're selling you. Share Jesus without fear. So they have a program called Share Jesus Without Fear. Grow, and it's all capitalized. And then, or the net so these are four different programs that they have on how you can sew in uh, i don't know what the net is but i just thought it was a really interesting uh name but you know i looked these up and they're actual programs that they sell you there through the, the through lifeway resources look you want to learn a soul and just come to our church and go soul winning with us we'll do it for free hey, i ain't going to charge you a dime you know if you want to buy me a bottle of water go for it and if you don't it doesn't make a difference we're still going to go soul winning with you and I'll give you the gospel message. It'll be consistent and you'll hear it all the same, all the same time. You know, then they, then they say uh, gospel. Uh, they, they're saying that they use track or other printed gospel. You know, I'm not opposed to printed material and tracks and things like that. But the challenge is that sometimes it can detract from God's word. You know, there's, not, there's nothing more effective. I've used so many tools in the past because, you know, I was trying to learn this the right way. But the best way is just God's word. It says, habit number two, soul winner, share Christ anytime, anywhere. I'm, I'm for that too. Uh, the challenge is here, they're not telling you about setting up a time. And I've been a soul winner like that, where I'll try, I'll, and I still do that. I'll share Christ anywhere, anytime. The only challenge is that life happens. And there's times where, you know, if you're at a job, the Bible says that everything you do, you do it for the Lord. And you have a responsibility to do that job first. <laughs> You know, and I'm not, say, I'm not belittling the gospel message, but look, if you have a scheduled time to go gospel winning uh, and soul winning, I mean gospel winning, soul winning and giving the gospel, then you're going to focus on the things that God has you to do because he wants us to do things decently and in order. You know, not every time that you're out in public, the opportunity presents itself. 
And even when it does present itself, sometimes it's just to plant a seed. You know, if you're on a train, you might, you might start the presentation and then the next stop they're leaving. You might not be able to get it all the way down. I'm not discouraging you. I think you should go ahead and give them, you know, uh, uh, your gospel uh, business card or invite them to church or a YouTube card with the, you know, the Bible way to heaven. I'm just saying that if we have it scheduled, we'll be much more effective. You know, if we do it on a regular basis, we'll be much more effective than just an anywhere opportunity. You're going to see what I mean by this because you'll see habit number seven, how, what they mean by anywhere, anytime. You know, I give the gospel anywhere, anytime, but... The Bible, you know, God has a specific, but if I'm showing up to work to provide for my family, I have to first work and make sure that that's what I do first. If the opportunity presents itself, then we do that. But if you set a time aside, like today, where we went from, you know, today I think we, we got started a little bit later, but at like 2.45 to 4, I think it was 3 to 4, an hour and a half, that time is set aside for nothing else but so winning. I have no distractions. I have no worry that, that you know whether I'm gonna affect my family. As a matter of fact, that's part of our family plan is to go do this, right? But look at habit number three. They're saying soul winners are adaptable in their presentation of the gospel. Hey, look, if you're gonna be adaptable, the only thing you should be adaptable to is that you can take them to other verses to address some of the concerns that they have. But what they're addressing here is they're saying, look, most most do not rely on mechanical or go, or canned gospel presentations. So they're knocking that. My, my presentation is very mechanical, it's very canned. I will, I have verses and I have the ability to be flexible, but first, you gotta learn that gospel message. You gotta learn you're a sinner, the penalty for the sin, you believe on Jesus Christ, you believe he's the way, the truth, and life, you believe Jesus is, is God. If you don't know that, how are you gonna be flexible? You know, I mean, they say they have developed their own particular style, uh, use language and illustrations, and each, each witnessing encounter will be different. So, you're saying, well, that doesn't sound so bad, except that if you notice one thing that's, that's standing out here about these habits is no, they haven't referenced the Bible, and they haven't given you any Bible verses to back this up. Number four, so when I see their interaction with other people as divine appointments. Look, I believe that, but I'm not waiting around like, and I'm not, because they're going to say, they say they begin each day with a sense of expectation. Look, there's days where I'm tired. I'm not, and there's days I begin the day and I am not expecting anything but to roll over and go back to bed. I mean, let's not pretend like you're zippity doo all the time. I mean, that's the problem with this, you know, positive mentality uh, crowd that God's going to throw tribulations your way. You know, if you read the book of Job, there's several instances of Job where he's not getting up every day with a sense of expectation. His only sense of expectation was, Lord, why don't you take me from the dust I came from the dust I'm going to return. You know, that's the kind of mentality to discourage anybody because if they don't feel that, then maybe they're not good soul winners. You know, that's a lie of the devil. You know what a good soul winner is? The guy who shows up when he doesn't want to do it. There's days when we show up and it's hot and you're tired and you just didn't get much rest because the kids kept you up that night and you just show up anyways. That's the expectation you have. Divine intervention is that you plow through the challenges and tribulations and obstacles that God puts in your life. You know. They're saying here, uh, let me not lose. Oh, so they feel a divine sense of mission. They see themselves as instruments of God. They seek to make the most of their encounter with others perp uh, by purposely initiating and leading the conversation in a spiritual area. Look, I don't want to talk about spiritual matters. I want to talk about your soul and your eternal spiritual state. I don't want to have this, this discussion about you know, what you think about angels, you know, and I, the only reason I bring up is pastor preached on angels. I want to know if you're going to tell me we can talk about after you're saved and we can go through the Bible. But I don't want to hear what your thoughts are on whatever without the Bible presentation first. You know, the lady, that, the last lady we led to the Lord, she was trying to tell me about her son and he wouldn't go to church. And before I put any pre preconceived notion in her, I gave her the gospel. Once we finished, guess what? We talked about her son. I said, don't worry about your son. He just believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. If he never goes to church again, when he dies, he's going to heaven. Now, I did tell your son that he should go to church, but I don't know if we can force him. He is a teenager at the end of the day. You know, that's going to happen. You know, right here, uh, they're saying habit number six, soul winners do not worry about their results. Soul winners realize they cannot save people. People come to Christ only through the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm not really going to knock on that one. We shouldn't worry about the results. But you know what? What we should worry is about the results that we can affect. The result that, that's most important is not how many people we lead to Christ, but how consistent we are in our soul winning action. You know, the result that matters is that we show up on a regular and consistent basis. 
you know, that we say, hey, we're going to do this. And, you know, we're not perfect. We're all going to fail. And we're not. But the consistency is what matters. And that we plant that seed clearly and correctly. That's where I'm getting at with this. You'll see this. It, you know, number six says soul winners are involved in church evangel evangelism programs but are not limited by them. Look, there's no other evangelism program other than a soul winning program. All the other programs are to, should be to edify and grow the church. But honestly, I mean, I hate to be so, maybe, or maybe I am so simplistic, but the only way to lead someone to Christ is a clear gospel message. I don't know why we need tricks and gimmicks. You know, if you want to have a choir, if you want to have, you know, Bible studies and all that, you know, those are great programs. But if they're interfering with the gospel message, then maybe you shouldn't have them at all. It says uh, uh, right here, uh, but this is where they really got me. Habit number seven, soul winners pray consistently for opportunities to share Christ with others. Soul winners pray for those whom they have witnessed. They pray for those who, who, with whom they have not yet witnessed. They pray for divine appointments at witnessing opportunities. Look, I just pray that I am consistent in the ability to show up. Right? What they're basically saying here is that the, the best way to soul win, and it, it's a term called lifestyle evangelism, is that you... You get into the Word and you lead such a good life that people will just be drawn to you and ask you about Jesus Christ. And I mean, and, I, and, you, and it's not exaggerated. Look this up and you can see all the other links. You can see the type of programs that they're selling. I, I, wasn't, I was going to go into but you know, I'm not. And, and you say, well, why are you knocking on stuff like this? I'm knocking on it because the main message should just be from the Bible. You know, if this was all leading these points, we're leading to the fact that we're going to give you a consistent tool. We're going to give you a consistent message. You know, you're going to have a clear gospel presentation. It'd be fine. But this is all just leading to the excuse of the only way that I soul win is if the spirit moves and, you know, lightning falls from the sky and there's a big arrow in the sky that's pointing to that guy and says, soul win to him. That's not, <laughs> that's not the case at all. You know, when we go out soul winning, we just knock on doors. We don't know who's going to open that door. I'm not, you know, the divine intervention is the fact that we're doing the job. I mean, there's times where you see in, in Job's life, I mean, if you think about divine intervention, and I didn't mean to talk so much about Job, but what does the book start out with? Job 1. God's the one that said to uh, Satan, have you considered my son Job? Heard him, And then what did, the, what did the devil do? The devil was like, look, of course he loves you. You give him everything. And what did God say? Okay, well then, try him. Just don't kill him. I mean, and, he, and everything was taken. That's from, that, was, that came from God. So if you're waiting around for God to give you like, you know, peaches and flowers and a great car and, you know, all this money so that you can go preach the gospel, you're, you're going about it wrong. Probably when you should go so wedding, it's when it's hardest, when it's the most uncomfortable when you don't feel like it, when you don't know the gospel message the best way, when you, know, when you have trouble and trials and tribulations in your life, when maybe you're, you know, things aren't that great at work and you don't have that much money in your pocket, that's when you should go soul winning because that's probably what God's trying to do is to be like, are you committed to me when the times are tough? Everybody can go do the good things when it's easy, but when it's tough, it's, uh, you know, that's when it really counts. And that's the challenge with stuff like this is that it deters from the message. So anyways, I didn't want to get too much off it. I, I, the message won't be... Uh, it's not, it's not a belaboring message. I mean, it's a simple message. You're either going to do it or you're not. I'm not, I mean, there's not, I'm just going to give you some references to the Bible and what it says, right? The, you know, the, way, the greatest way to serve God is in the Great Commission. Notice I didn't say just in soul winning. When God gave the Great Commission, He gave us specific things that we should do. And that's the challenge also is sometimes people just get all enamored with just soul winning, soul winning, and they forget all the other parts. Now, I just preached a couple weeks ago how Paul said, you know, God sent me to preach the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and not just not to baptize, but to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that didn't deter for Paul from baptizing people and from discipling them and from all that. It's just the, pre, the thing that takes precedent should be the gospel message. But there's more to that. If you turn over to Matthew 28, just turn over to Matthew 28. And I should have asked you to turn there earlier. And we're going to be in Matthew and then we're going to go to Romans. But be in Matthew and then we're going to go back to Matthew 10. But if you turn over to Matthew 28, and you look there down in verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And this, is taught, this is right before Jesus goes up into heaven. A couple of things stand out. It says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, colon, but some doubted. So even after all this, there's still some doubt. That's just life. That's why I don't like this seven habits, because the seven habits makes it pretend like 
the minute that you're that you get saved, everything's perfect. No, it's actually the opposite. The devil's going to attack you. It says, but some doubt it. Verse 18 says, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go, that's the key word, go ye therefore, don't wait, go. See, all this was saying, I'm, I'm praying and waiting for opportunities. No, you create the opportunities. But then here's the, the, the gist of it. It says, teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teach, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So there's more. You know, we want to soul win. We want to lead people to Christ. That's number one. But then he's, he's telling them, look, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Why? Because that's the way we're going to get more soldiers for Christ. Because not everybody that gets saved is going to do work for the Lord. That's just... That's just the, the, the plain truth. And then what he say? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So what does that require? It requires someone to preach and someone to sit in the congregation and learn. There's some teaching and preaching there. So it's not just all, you know, about soul winning. We make soul winning the, the most important thing in our personal lives and in the church's ministry because we know that this is a life and death situation eternally. But we're also going to show up to church on Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Wednesday because God said, look, not only if someone's teaching, then someone needs to be sitting to learn, right? So we can just apply that even though it didn't say it. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. So we need, we need to give them more than just the gospel presentation. There's a lot more in here than just, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's ways to deal with your wife and your kids and your friends and your family, life, business, workers, co-workers. You know, just all the things that you're going to deal with. And then, and then you want to baptize them. You know, these are important things. But there's power in God's Word. Go back a few pages uh, to Matthew 10. But in the meantime, what I'm going to do is just read for you Jeremiah 23. You don't have to turn there, but go to Matthew 10. We're going to be in verse 26. The reason that, I'm kind of, that, that, that this is so important is because God gave us a great commission. So soul winning is important because that's part of the great commission. But also... He gave us the great commission of the baptizing and the preaching because there's power in God's word. And I'm not going to touch on that so much today because I already preached a little bit on it last week. But we need God's infallible word. If you see there in Jeremiah, oh, you don't, I'm, I'll read for you Jeremiah 23, 28. It says, the prophet, that had a, hath, the prophet that had a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? saith the Lord. It's not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. And if you're reading Jeremiah 23, the latter part is talking about lying prophets and how they're perverting the word of God. And in there, in 20, verses 28 through 30, he talks about it. There's no need for you to do that. There's no need for you to embellish. He says, my word is like fire. Not only that, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Look, I've gone out with other churches when I visit other cities, soul winning, and not all the churches think like we do. And I remember I had a one time I had a soul winning partner with me. And, you know, I didn't. By the way, if you're going to go to another church and visit and, and, and join a program because that's where you're visiting, you're, you're not there to cause dissension. You're not there to call, tell them how much better you, you think you're doing it. So, because the reason is I'm going to make a point. I disagreed with the, my soul winner at the time because he went out there and I said, hey, so, uh, you know, where's your Bible? He's like, oh, I don't need my Bible to go soul winning. I just give him the gospel message. I memorized it. I'm, you might or might not disagree, and I'm not saying that there's situations where, you know, you might have to give the Bible out of memory. But if you've scheduled the time, the thing that you should carry with you is the sword. This is like the, the, the weapon. Because sometimes you tell somebody something, and they're like looking at you, but then the minute they read it, you know, you point it to them, and you say, look, all it says is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, or believe, and all of a sudden it just clicks. There's power in this word. It breaks down barriers that you could never break down because at the end of the day, we're just the messenger. You know, I mean, right there he says, It's not my word like as fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. How do you break through a hardened heart? Not because of my great words and my wonderful testimony, because of the words of Jesus Christ. Nobody did it better than Jesus Christ. He paid it all. 
I mean, there's no point in telling my testimony when I have a better testimony in God's Word. There's no point in trying to tell people how great my salvation experience was when I have Jesus' words right there, and He can explain it all. I mean, how much greater is it to say that He took on the sins of the world, your sins and mine? All of a sudden it clicks, right? And then when people look at you, you know, the lady today, uh, I, I asked her, you know, especially when I speak to Hispanics, I always bring up the point of, uh, or lately I bring up the point of, you know, if you killed yourself in, in several years, you know, you go to heaven or hell, and usually they say hell. And then I said, well, do you think God's a liar? And she's like, no. And then I took her to Titus 1-2, and, it, you know, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And she looked at that, and she's like, she all of a sudden felt that fear that she didn't want to call God a liar. So then I said, look, based on the word, if you killed yourself, but you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, where are you going? She's like, well, according to the Bible, heaven. Of course. And there's nothing better to do it than if you show them God's word. You know, I mean, I'm pretty sure I probably could convince her, but I don't want to take that risk. This is a serious matter. This is a serious matter. You shouldn't be messing around with God's word. Go to Matthew 10, verse 26, uh, and it says there, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be reve revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your hair, head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are, more value, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. There's no better way to confess Jesus Christ than going out there and preaching the gospel, than being a soul winner. You know, sometimes I think that uh, Christianity tries to romanticize being unashamed of Jesus Christ to the point where the only type of, uh, the only type of stance you hear is like this grandstand. You know, I remember growing up and people, you know, being a Seventh-day Adventist, they, they, they would always scare us that there would be another Sunday law. You know, back in the 70s, you had the blue moon laws. And so Seventh-day Adventists love to, like, you know, belabor that point. They're like, one day, there's going to be Sunday laws again. They're going to come after you. And they're going to ask you to stand. And, and you're going to stand before people. And before you die, you'll be able to, you know, confess this and that and whatever. And that sounds really exciting. I think with, with uh, Hollywood and the movies, you know, they've romanticized this issue. But the reality is, right here, God just wants us to confess Him. And it's not always grand, grandiose. You know, nobody attacked us today. Nobody was pointing guns at our head saying, do you believe in Jesus Christ or not? No, but we confessed Him. We were unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what did he say? Him will I confess also before my Father. So we have to understand. And the other thing is, the only fear that we fear is God. Because he's the only one that can take your soul. And that soul, if he takes it and casts it out, it's going to hell. So there's something to be said about soul winning. Go to Romans 10. Go to Romans 10, just a couple of pages over. And there's something to be said about how it's biblical. And I'm giving you all the references here. And I, I, I could have given a lot more. But I just wanted to keep this very simple message that, you know, we have to give it through God's word because we've set up this now foundation of salvation. Now you're getting baptized. Now you're learning what God's infallible word is and you're going to stand on it. And it's, it's true no matter what. Now we're going to also see that, uh, you know, the only one that, can, can, that has power over the soul is God and that we should only be unashamed, uh, that we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you see Romans 10, what does it say? It says, Fruitsoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the easy one. Most people can understand that, right? But here's the part that I want to focus on. It says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in, who, in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? We need the preachers to go out into the highways and the hedges to preach the word of God. And this applies. That's the only time this applies to both men and women. The Bible is very specific about the women's role in the church and in the home. But when it comes to preaching the gospel, let's go. Right? It says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? 
So there's, there's something to be said about a church that says not only are we going to go, the leadership's going, but we're, we want to send you. You know, one of the things I love about Pastor Cobb is every time I call him, Pastor, we need to buy more Bibles because we need them for the English and the Spanish-speaking people. We need, uh, I'm gonna, we're going to have an event out at, down in the border, and I want to go ahead and have the church sponsored so people show up. It's all there. You know why? Because he's sending me and he's sending others. You know, all those people that have never met him, indirectly, he's the one that sent them. It says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? And of course, he's sending and, and I'm going or I'm sending and they're going because Jesus sent us. He says, go ye therefore. You know, it's not because Pastor Cobb has this uh, huge, he's, he's this big uh, dictator and he has all this power. No, the power comes from Christ. He's obeying Christ, so we obey Christ. You know, they always say, and I, I've used this before, but if your leadership's doing this, the people that follow are doing this. And if, so if the leadership falls here, then everybody falls behind. So you need the leader to be doing the most so that everybody else follows uh, suit. Let's, let's keep reading there in, um, in verse 16. And it says, uh, oh no, in verse 15, it says, How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith the Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that's why, based on this Bible verse, if you're going to go so winning, I think you should have the Bible. As a matter of fact, according to this verse, that's the only way to do it. They can only have faith by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And let me tell you something, you could probably memorize it, but I'm going to tell you something that's very important. We make mistakes. And there's times in here where, I mean, I know a verse, and I know that I can quote it. And then you get up here, and then all of a sudden I'm going to quote it, and I butcher it. And it's just, you're thinking of other things. You're speaking in public. If you have distractions, that could happen. But if you have the Word of God, there's no butchering it. God's Word is true. You're not going to mess this thing up if you have the sword. So, in conclusion, because I, I just wanted to make sure that... You see why I'm so zealous about this thing. Because the challenge is that I was given this Romans road at age 25. And then, and then I was given no direction. And I had not read my Bible through. Like I, and so I hadn't understood all these verses. And I didn't understand that, that you needed a clear gospel message. And that there was more to uh, the Romans road. You know, I was confined. You, you ever get instructions? And, you, and sometimes, you know, like uh, you've heard that, uh, that expression about... How, you know, many years ago during World War II, there wasn't enough money, so, so people had, would buy smaller pots. And then like three or four generations la later, you know, the, the, the granddaughter, the great-granddaughter is cooking the chicken. And she's cooking the chicken in the pot, and she sticks it out with the, the feet are sticking out. And finally, somebody gets the bright idea going, Mom, why is it that we cook the chicken with the feet out? And so the mom goes, well, I don't know. That's just the way we've always done it. So then the mom turns to her mom. It's like, Mom, why are we cooking the chicken with the feet out? And she doesn't know. Because I mean, it's like, this is way, you know. And this has actually happened. And people are like, well. So they finally get to the source. They get to the great-grandmother. And they're like, why do we cook the chicken with the feet out? What's the purpose of that? She's like, well, we didn't have money to buy big pots. So that's the only way the chicken fit. Oh, so you're saying we can cook the, we can just dump the whole chicken in there. Well, you could have done it all along. That's the problem with, you know, when you just get these, like, canned things without the Word of God, the, you know, the more you read the Word of God, the easier it is to give the gospel message. Because if you learn the Romans road, do it. But you know what? It's really good if you start memorizing other scriptures because not everybody you preach to is going to respond to the Romans road. Sometimes you've got to go to Ephesians 2. Sometimes you've got to tell them how they're the sons of God. Or you're going to run into a Jehovah's Witness and you've got to take them to Revelation and show how the 144,000 are there with you know, the, the millions and millions of people that got saved. You know, there's all this stuff, but what you got to do is get into the Word of God. This is a serious matter. And most people just take it lightly because they read articles like the one I just read to you. And they go to churches where they're like, look, as long as you people, people ought to see Jesus in you. Oh, okay, that's great. Have you read the words of Jesus? Because if they want to see Jesus in you, you're, you're offending a lot of uh, spiritual leaders but you're leading a lot of the lost to Christ. You know, Jesus, who did he pick fights with or who did he always get angry at and, and offend the most? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. But who was he compassionate over? 
the sinners, the lost, those who thought that they didn't deserve any better, right? Have you ever run into somebody that, whether you're out soul winning door to door, or just, you know, talking to them, and they're like all tatted up, and they've been in jail and stuff, and you start giving them the gospel message, they're like, oh, I don't, I know I'm going to hell. And, and then you start saying, look, but God died for you. It, it resonates because they know that there's nothing they could do to go to heaven because they've just had this ridiculous life. Those are easy. The hard ones are the ones that, that think that they're good. You know, every time I run into someone like this lady, thank God she got saved, but you run into that lady and she's like, oh, I know I'm going to heaven. Why? Well, because I'm a good person. Well, the Bible says there's not righteous, no, not one. So, I mean, you're not a good person. This is, this is a serious matter. Go to 1 Thessalonians. And we just got a couple, a couple of verses and we'll close out. Go to 1 Thessalonians uh, 2. Go to 1 Thessalonians 2 and we see here about the, it's talking about the gospel. We got a couple of verses to read. It says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain, but even after, you know what, I abbreviated that. And I'm reading off my notes, and I just want to make sure you guys are following along with me. Let me make sure that I'm in the right. If I'm going to... Yeah, I think it's First Timothy. I mean, First Thessalonians. Did I say Second Thessalonians? I said First Thessalonians? Okay, I just want to make sure I'm in the right place. It just, I just checking myself. Okay, it says there in First Thessalonians 2, 1, it says, For yourselves, brethren... Know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not a deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth the hearts. God's allowed us to put, and he's put at trust that we should give the gospel. It's an important thing. This is a serious matter. For neither at any time used we flattering words. We didn't give you seven habits of successful soul winning. We just gave you the gospel. As ye know, uh, as ye know nor, our, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherish, cherish, cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but all, also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblamely we have behaved ourselves among you that believe, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank, God, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. See, this set of verses talking about the gospel, about how we're living for the gospel, and so we're living a better life. You know what the gospel does? It's a serious matter. It cleans up your life. Even if you think you're living clean, you know, go out there and try to get, because you feel that weight. That seriousness. What did it say? That he's allowed us and he put the trust with us in the gospel in verse 4. This is a serious matter, but not only that, we also charge others. He's exhorting them. He's saying, look, I'm charging you. We're preaching unto you so that it takes effect. And he closes out, right? He says in verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God, which ye have heard of us, ye receive the not as word of men, but as in truth, the word of God which effectively worketh also in you that believe. See, what he's saying is, look, I'm not just out there soul winning, but then I'm also going to tell you that you should get baptized, and I'm going to invite you to church. Is everybody that we lead to Christ going to show up? Probably 90% of the people that we've invited to church, or maybe over, have not showed up to church. But that's not for me to decide. It's for me to charge them with. 
because one of them is going to take and it's going to effectually work in those that believe. See, it's not just enough. I mean, it is enough for salvation to give the soul winning gospel presentation and lead them to Christ. But for us that want to continue to grow, there's more to it. We've got to put in the work. We've got to put in the, com the, com uh, the exhortation. We've got to compel them. We've got to tell them, hey, this is a serious matter. Because sometimes I've heard Pastor Cobb say it, and, and I agree 100%. This thing of eternity, we take too lightly. It's a light matter to most people. We worship death. We worship war. We worship Hollywood. We worship wickedness. We worship evil. We, we turn a blind eye to pedophilia. We turn a blind eye to sodomy. We turn a blind eye to adultery and fornication and all sorts of things. But when people get up and say, hey, you need to go out there and preach the gospel, a clear gospel message. Oh, you're just a Bible thumper. You're, 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 just, uh, you're just weird and radical. Of course I am. You know, for years, not only me, because I've said it before, but today, right now, I have people that I've known that are Seventh-day Adventists. And, and I mean, I'm just, and, and there's Mormons, and Jehovah's Witness, and Hindus, and all that today, right now, that are taking their last breath into eternity. They're taking their last breath on this earth where they probably will experience the most comfort they've ever had in their life, even if they had the worst life ever. Even if they were raised and abused and just they had just the worst luck and they never found a good job and they were just hungered all their life. That life is better than the life they're going into without Christ. It says, tormented day and night, forever and ever. I mean, I remember as, as a kid just even joking around with brothers and cousins and sisters and just getting tormented a little bit was no fun. And that was just in jest. Nobody's ever tor I've never been tormented like in war or, uh, you know, out of malice. Think about that. And this says forever and ever and ever. I mean, I, I don't know how else to put it. You know, I, I, I did this earlier, but people, sometimes we, we put the numbers so big, but we just got to put things in perspective. You know, if you put things in, uh, in proper perspective, you start to realize how short our lives are. You know, I did this earlier this morning, but I'll do it again. A million seconds, a million seconds. That means if I was to sit here for and count one, two, three, a million seconds, which is a lot to people. You know, if I told you here's a million dollars, you'd be like, yeah, that's awesome. That's great. I'm going to pay off everything. And by the way, a million dollars in today's money is not a lot, but a million seconds is only 12 days. So if I counted a million seconds, it'd be 12 days. A billion seconds, that's like 31 to 32 years. Because, you know, I'm not going to be, that's just if I just sat here. But a, a trillion seconds is 31,000 years. In other words, I could sit here and count for the rest of my life and I would never ever get close to a trillion. That's how big eternity is. Those seconds are just ticking by and ticking by. And, and what we do is we complain because, you know, we complain about being in discomfort or I just can't get this right or so-and-so did me wrong and this and that. And instead, we don't focus on the gospel presentation. You know how, how you get over stuff real easy? You know, show up on a Sunday afternoon and go soul winning and you'll realize how great it is to give a gift of eternity through Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to close out with this. And, and uh, you know, what's, what is the soul winning for us? It's a clear gospel message. There's only four things we're concerned about. You know, we want people to admit they're a sinner. Because there is people that think that they've never sinned. I've actually run into them. It's very rare, but they do exist. That, you know, you've got to realize the penalty for your sin. And, and it's a severe thing. You want to tell people, hey, look, you're going to hell. And it's serious. You know, I, I mean, sometimes people get offended, but it's okay. Because if they believe on Jesus Christ, then it was all worth it. That's why we're going to be hated. That's why there's trials and tribulations. We want them to accept the, the salvation message, and it's a free gift. It should be clear. And then we want to believe that Jesus Christ paid for your sins. And so you got to preach Jesus Christ of the Bible. Because that's what I, you know, that's the challenge when you start getting this watered down instruction is you also start getting watered down versions of the Bible. You start getting down watered down ideas of the gospel. You know, your gospel presentation should only be one. There's only one gospel. And it's found in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's only one Jesus, the Son of God, who is eternal. Never had beginning, never had end. These are important concepts to understand. 
People get all caught up in all kinds of things. And then if you wanted to, I mean, I'm just going to throw those for the sake of time. Uh, don't turn there. Just Mark 6, verse 7. He gives us some formulas. There's more there. But Mark 6, 7, he says, And he called unto him the twelve, uh, and began to send them forth two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. That's why we go out two by two. Because Jesus, uh, you know, set it up like that. Luke 10, 2 says, Therefore saith he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of our harvest, that, we would, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. That's why we preach and pray for soul winners. Because the harvest truly is plenteous. I mean, you look at, we made, by the way, this is a, this is a learning process. We made the mistake of getting a map of the entire city of Houston. So whenever we shade in our section, it looks like we didn't do anything because there's 6 million people in this Houston surrounding area. So we're going to get a condensed version just so you can give yourself some motivation. But even then, you realize how big the task is. I mean, we have this, and I, you don't see it here. Maybe I'll show it. But there's this white uh, map over here, white and black. And there's some coloring in it. And 90% of it is white. Probably more than that. And, and that's that we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years. That's just the way it is. You know, in Acts 1, 6, just says, When ye therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth. What did Jesus say? He said, Look, the only thing you're going to preach is God's word. So if we're going to talk about the end times, it should just come from God's word. He's saying, don't concern yourself with anything besides that. What you're concerned with is going into all the world and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, if, if we can, we will support anybody who's out soul winning. The only, the only missionary that, that should exist is the missionary that's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. If he so happens to build a church or, or give some health, or build a house for people, then so be it. But if he's not doing the first works, the first love, then it's all in vain. So let's go ahead and close out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach a message like this, Lord. And, you know, the idea was just to give a simple idea of why we're so zealous for this. And, and by the way, when I mean zealous, I mean that we're zealous, good or bad. Because I'm not always, uh, I mean, I'm just going to confess my fault here in this prayer. I'm not always... Uh, you know, 100% excited to go out soul winning. Sometimes, you know, it just takes a little effort on my end to just go out there and, and start walking that, uh, knocking that first door. But man, once we lead someone to Christ, uh, you know, that zeal comes back and it's just like the first time all over again, Lord. So, and uh, the first time soul winning, not, not salvation. I don't want to confuse anybody on that point. Once saved, always saved. But Lord, we, uh, you know, we appreciate and we thank you for leaders in our church whether it be one or two or three or a hundred, whatever the number is, Lord, we know that that's the number that you've set for us for such a time as this. So, Lord, just help us to go out there and do your will, do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.